I'm delighted to have you here and welcome you to our discussion with Director General Gurry. Um, the Director General will offer a few opening remarks and then we would like to open the floor for comments and questions from you. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Anna. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon to you all and uh, really uh, let me express our gratitude to you for having come this afternoon and uh, for having come in such large numbers. Uh, we're really very grateful. A sign of the importance that we attach to NGOs is the fact that we have appointed, uh, since we last met, a new head of uh, uh, the NGO sector, and that is Anna Morovitz uh, Mansfield, who's seated next to me and who just uh, spoke to you. Um, and uh, it's, as I said, a sign of importance that we attach to it and of our um, intention to intensify uh, the channels of communication that we have with you and our engagement with you. And we hope that uh, it will be reciprocal, that you'll find ways to intensify your engagement with us. Uh, I thought that I'd speak for about 20 minutes, if you agree, uh, and then we can have an interactive dialogue, which will probably be much more interesting, I think, than, than the monologue that you'll receive for the first 20 minutes. But I'd like to try to give you a, a, a brief overview of where, what happened in 2012, basically, and uh, what we think may happen in 2013, or what we're planning uh, should happen in 2013. And let me start with our global uh, systems, global IP systems. I know many of you represent users of these systems. Uh, they represent the basis of uh, revenue generation of the organization. It's 94% of the revenue of the organization come from these systems. So they're obviously very help, uh, very essential to the organization, and they enable us to do all of the other things that we do and about which I'll speak, the normative program and our uh, capacity building programs and so on. Uh, we had a very good year in all of those uh, systems last year in 2012. In the Patent Cooperation Treaty, it saw uh, 194,000 international patent applications filed. Uh, uh, that was an increase of about 6.3%, which, when you consider the fragility of the economic, econ the world economy uh, throughout 2012, uh, it, that was a very positive result, a very good result. In the Madrid system, uh, we had about 42,000 international applications. It was a rise of about 3.1%. Uh, and in the Hague system, it's a, uh, it was a small rise of about 3.3%, but it's a small number of applications as yet. So what is happening in these systems? Uh, I think, first of all, from a global point of view, we see the continuation of the shift from uh, west to east in the use of these systems. This is very pronounced. If you take the PCT, it's around about 39% of uh, the international patent applications filed under the PCT come from Asia, uh, and principally, of course, from Japan, from uh, China, and from the Republic of Korea. And that compares with about 30% uh, of uh, international applications coming from <coughs> Europe, the extended Europe of the uh, European Patent Convention, and about 28% coming from the United States of America, 27, 28% from the United States of America. So this shift that we've seen has been rather rapid. You know, uh, it's occurred over the last 10 years only, uh, and uh, every sign is that it's here to stay. You may also have noticed that we publish each year in December a World Intellectual Property Indicators report. Uh, and the report that we published in December indicated that China had become, become for the first time, the biggest patent office in the world. <clears throat> and that is uh, uh, measured in terms of the number of applications received. It received more applications than the United States Patent and Trademark Office in third place is uh, Japan. So it's another uh, indicator of the shift, if you like. Uh, what else is happening in the PCT this year uh, for the users of that system, and I know some of you represent users, we have a very important uh, IT system, which we call ePCT, which will uh, make life 
uh, for users and for officers, uh, all part of the network of the PCT, much easier uh, because it's really an interactive, secure dossier access that is provided by this. But uh, its significance is primarily in terms of functionality and in terms of productivity, both for the officers or, or for the officers, the users, and for ourselves. Uh, for Madrid system for um, trademarks, let me say that uh, the major thing happening is, is seeing this system expand geographically. Uh, so we've just gone to 90 members. If you compare that to the PCT, it's 145 members in the PCT. But uh, what's happening in Madrid, last year we saw uh, New Zealand, the Philippines, Colombia and Mexico all enter the system. Colombia and Mexico are extremely important because Latin America has been traditionally outside the system. Uh, and we expect that trend to continue in 2013. We expect India to be coming into the system in the first six months. And we know that all of the ASEAN countries are committed to coming into the system by 2015. So we hope that rather that Malaysia and Thailand may, may do it in 2013. Similar things happening for the Hague system for industrial designs, which has always been the poor cousin in the family of you know, intellectual property uh, global systems. But the United States Congress passed legislation in December to facilitate, which will enable the uh, accession of the United States to the Hague system. We hope that occurs by the end of this year, 2013. We also hope that China will join the system in 2013. So this will be a massive transformation of that system, massive transformation. Uh, and we expect that in 2014, 15, both Japan and Korea, Korea will come into the system. They've both committed to doing so. So uh, overall, I think um, quite good results in those systems. And as I say, the major you know, macro picture is this shifting geography that we all know about and that we see occurring in the economy more generally. Can I move to the uh, normative agenda of the organization? Uh, and of course, the big event for 2012 was the conclusion of the Beijing Treaty uh, on the protection of audiovisual performances. Uh, and this we were very proud of as an organization because it's really the first substantive law treaty to be concluded in the field of intellectual property since 1996. Uh, in 1999, if I'm not mistaken, Francois will remember, uh, we concluded a revised act of the Hague Agreement, but it's of course a procedural treaty, and, and in 2006, uh, five, uh, 2000 we concluded the Patent Law Treaty, 2005 or six, the uh, Singapore Treaty, uh, but they, are, they were procedural formalities treaties, so uh, it was quite interesting that we were able to get a substantive law treaty uh, concluded for the first time for a significant number of years. Uh, why did that happen? And I think that's something that we have been uh, trying to analyze as an organization. And by organization, I mean both the member states have been discussing this and saying, you know, uh, how did this happen and, and what's, the, what's the formula for success? And we've been trying to do it as a, as a secretariat. Because you know it happens, of course, or it happened against the backdrop of a, a, it has severely diminished capacity, international capacity to agree. You know, whatever the area is, trade, intellectual property, wherever, uh, we know that the international organizations are all challenged in their capacity to agree. Uh, so we think that there were several probably uh, ingredients which we will try, of course, to replicate in the coming years. Uh, and central to those, I think, is the fact that it was a specific and technical treaty. You know, you have much more uh, possibility, I think, or capacity to agree where uh, the issue is specific and technical and you can, you can see the landscape of interested parties more easily uh, than if it's a, a large thing like climate change or the environment or or disarmament or world peace or whatever it might be, uh, where uh, it's just the world's uh, alignment of interests are just too complex. So we think this is uh, extremely important. 
Uh, and going forward, we have that very much in mind. Uh, and going forward, looking at this year, uh, the big event in the normative area will be the Marrakesh Diplomatic Conference uh, to be held in the month of June uh, to uh, conclude a treaty to improve access to published works on the part of visually impaired and print disabled persons. Uh, now the status of that one, let me say a few words and I'll be very guarded because I see there are a number of interested parties on on both sides uh, here for this. The status of that one is the member states took a decision in, uh, in December in an extraordinary General Assembly to hold this diplomatic conference, which is, if you like, a sign of confidence that uh, agreement is entirely possible. You know, they wouldn't take that decision unless they were. And it's secondly, a sign of the political will of the member states to actually do this treaty. Uh, and I think that that is there now. But that said, uh, we have not reached full agreement. Uh, and there will be an important meeting starting the week after next of our Standing Committee on Copyright, uh, in which we will endeavour to get agreement on some of the outstanding issues. And if I may, let me say one word, uh, uh, and I'll put my neck out here about this, because I think it's very important. Uh, we can, as an international mu uh, community, make a big contribution here by concluding this treaty. Uh, and we can uh, actually render a good service to visually impaired persons. But it's only going to succeed if that is our target and that is our focus. So if anyone wants to revise the international copyright system in this treaty, we're not going to get the treaty. You know, uh, the focus, our focus has to be to solve the problem of, uh, of diminished access on the part of visually impaired persons. Now, of course, the, the method of solution is looking at the existing principles of the international copyright system and applying them. But the aim has to be to uh, conclude this treaty for the visually impaired. Uh, for as much, insofar as the aim is to rewrite the international copyright system, it's just not going to happen. So uh, I think this is, uh, if I may pass that message to you, it's extremely important because uh, I think the visually impaired community is looking to us for some leadership in solving this issue. Uh, there are three other, I would say, uh, issues on our normative agenda that I would like to mention. Um, for both uh, the, for this year, um, and they are without any order of priority, uh, or let me give you them in the order perhaps of from apparently easiest to apparently hardest, uh, and they are designs, uh, broadcasting, and genetic resources, tradi traditional knowledge, and traditional cultural expressions. So, uh, in the area of designs we are a long way advanced towards the conclusion of a design law formalities treaty which would do for designs what the Singapore uh, Treaty on the Law of Trademarks and the Patent Law Treaty did for trademarks and patents uh, respectively. It's not a substantive law treaty but it's nevertheless an important thing because if you look around the world I think there are several features of, of uh, the design landscape that suggests that this would be a good thing to do. One of those is the diversity, you know, the great diversity of procedures that apply that make life difficult for designers seeking protection. Uh, a second reason is that if you want an example of local innovation, and we all talk about that a lot, I think designs are it, you know, uh, because uh, if you look at the statistics, uh, the, the majority of design applications filed in developing countries are filed by residents. Uh, and the minority are filed by non-residents. If you look at the patent area, of course the majority of patent applications filed in a developing country, but actually in most countries, are filed by non-residents. And the minority by residents. 
So uh, there is a very strong participation of developing countries in the design system. And, this, and you don't have access problems uh, that you uh, might have uh, or might be perceived to exist in the case of patents. And you don't have any transfer of technology problem. Uh, you know, designs are something that human beings have, doing, have been doing since they started to make objects. So we think that this is an area that can make a contribution to business simplification. It's like the trade facilitation of intellectual property, if you like. Uh, and we hope very much that this will go forward with a positive decision in September of this year. Then uh, broadcasting is uh, a, a little bit more difficult, I think. The array of interests is, is more difficult. Uh, and the, of course, the technologies are changing very rapidly. But we see the process being led in particular by South Africa and Mexico uh, to move forward the uh, broadcasting agenda. And in principle, the member states have decided, uh, well, they've decided that there will be a consultation on this in the month of April. Uh, and in principle, they've decided that we should be uh, looking towards a diplomatic conference in 2014. But I think we have yet to see the uh, you know, the, the broadcasting negotiation unfold, and so we need to uh, see how this goes. But I think there is a gathering political will to do it. And the last area that I would mention uh, then is uh, the area that's the subject of a meeting this week, uh, genetic resources, traditional knowledge, traditional cultural expressions. I think some excellent progress has been made this week in the meeting, uh, but we are still a long way out. Uh, it's a very delicate process, as you all know. It's of fundamental importance. You know, it's of fundamental importance. The developing countries have been asking for this for uh, a long time now. It's been <coughs> under discussion for uh, since the year 2000. But I think that what we see is that there is, you know, genuine good faith engagement now, which is a change, uh, which we've seen emerge over the last two years, genuine good faith engagement, and a narrowing of options. Uh, and so we are getting a real negotiation going in this area. Uh, but that's not to underestimate the difficulty of, of this area, where the positions remain rather divided. Um, OK, uh, that's all I'm going to say on, on, on the normative area. We have other. Uh, uh, projects there, but I won't mention them. Uh, but perhaps um, a word, if I may, on uh, the whole area of development assistance and, um, and capacity building. Um, and we can develop it in discussion, if you like. But obviously, this organization spends a lot of time uh, and resources on trying to uh, deliver effective uh, capacity building services uh, and technical assistance. Uh, and we are constantly asking ourselves whether we are doing that, actually, whether we're, we're succeeding in that. Uh, and I think we've seen some areas in which there has been real progress. For example, let me mention the, uh, our activities for automating uh, industrial property offices around the world. And there we have projects in over 80 countries. You know, this is our so-called IPAS system, Intellectual Property Automation System. We have projects in over 80 countries. And uh, amongst other things, it's delivering digitized collections of patents which are going into our patentscape, patent scope uh, search uh, engine, uh, and digitized collections of trademark data. But it's obviously helping uh, the offices of developing countries to be much more connected. Now, this year we will, we will ramp up our activities in what might be considered loosely to be the equivalent of that in the copyright area. So I think uh, that I would suggest to you that if you look at the copyright area, uh, one of the features uh, is that the developing countries, or many developing countries, are culturally very rich, but distribution poor. Or if you like, in the in our, you know, new terminology, 
content rich and distribution poor. And why, you know, why, uh, he, so th there is a, a difficulty, if you like, of translating these cultural assets and this cultural richness into commercial assets. And why is that so? Uh, and at least part of the explanation, we believe, is that many of their collective management uh, organizations you know, are not wired, if you like, you know, in shorthand, in the old, old terminology. They're not, um, they're, they are not uh, connected into a digital marketplace the emerging global digital marketplace. So we think that ramping up our activities in helping collecting societies in developing countries to have efficient, uh, we call it WIPO cost, but it'll be rebranded, to have efficient uh, digital management systems uh, can be of great service. So those are just two examples I would give you of where we are trying to make our technical assistance and capacity building activities you know, relevant to uh, the effective use of intellectual <coughs> property in, in the economy. But there are obviously many other um, uh, elements to our capacity building program about which I won't uh, speak, but we can develop them, if you like, in the discussion. Um, I'm going to not make any further remarks there, uh, and I'll stop for the discussion, but uh, I know a number of you have been extremely kind in um, submitting uh, questions and topics for discussion, and either I can go through them, but I think much more interesting would be to hear from you, if I may call on you, uh, to, to uh, explain you know, uh, the, the question. So I, th I would start with the IPA, the International Publishers Association, who I think want to make some comments about NGOs' participation in WIPO's committee work uh, and training and information for WIPO staff uh, on IP industry developments. So, Jens, shall I hand over to you? Well, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity and uh, for allowing me to open up uh, our part of this discussion. Um, uh, uh, it was a very interesting expose you made there, uh, and uh, a lot of interesting data that you've given us. I would like to Thank you. highlight, uh, I, we were asked about suggestions for change, and uh, uh, we were not asked to, to give praise uh, for what's happening, so um, uh, I, um, whatever I say as a suggestion, therefore, is not a criticism, and I am not um, here to, to uh, say what's one good or bad. Um, I'm also not going to comment on uh, uh, ongoing negotiations between member states because I don't think this is the appropriate forum for that, um, but focus on issues that we can, uh, where I think you actually and uh, WIPO can, can make a difference. Um, I uh, put down two suggestions. The first one was actually the issue of how do NGOs collaborate with um, the various or in the various committees of WIPO. Um, the observation that I would make uh, is that um, despite uh, the many days that some con uh, committees go on, uh, it's always hard for the chairs uh, to find time uh, for the NGOs. Uh, now that the numbers of the NGOs have increased in all committees that we attend significantly, the time that we can actually contribute uh, to the plenary debate has become more and more limited. And uh, the question is, is this an effective way of integrating the voice of the NGO community in the debate, in particular, given the express uh, will of member states actually to hear more from uh, various stakeholders? And we've heard that in various uh, uh, committees. And uh, my suggestion, uh, I, I don't have a specific suggestion, except that now that we have an NGO liaison officer here, I think it would be useful for that lead liaison officer to speak with the chair to the extent that he's available before the meetings and to discuss with them how best to organize the effective communication of the NGO voices. That was my first yep. suggestion. Uh, Do thanks, you want to yes. take them one by may one? I, may I uh, make a comment? May, because I, I think others might want to chip in on the same uh, topic. But look, uh, I think it's a very, if I may say, it's a very important point you raise. And I would put it in a broader context than, the, than just the WIPO committees. I think this is, uh, 
if we want to take it in its broadest context, I would suggest that what is happening in the world is that, uh, you know, over we, we, what we've seen in the last 10 or so years is the diffusion of power. You know, it's no longer the case that governments exclusively possess all the power. We know this. Uh, you know, there is a range of uh, uh, other actors, non-state actors, that have acquired a much more po powerful position in society and in the economy. And what does that mean? I mean, it's, I think one of the things that it means for international organisations is that we have to uh, become better at multi-stakeholder engagement. Uh, and um, so what we call NGOs and their participation, we have to think about how we're doing that uh, because, because we have to respond to the developments that are occurring outside. And that's the context in which I would put your, if I may, your question. And, I, th and I, I think that there are three ways in which we, we principal ways in which we interact with non-state actors, if you like. Uh, and one is through public-private partnerships. So we have one of those in WIPO research. Uh, we will unveil another one this year in, in something called WIPO Green. Uh, and. Um, and we are working uh, I on, on this in, the connect in connection with the stakeholders platform. Mm -hmm. uh, and these are e examples of trying to achieve results through vehicles which are not classical, you know, old style secretariat of international organization approaches, but engaging in a multi-sectoral or multi-stakeholder vehicle. Uh, and I think a second way is that a lot of you, in various ways, whether you are representing industry or professional organisations or think tanks or a other NGOs, are involved in our technical assistance programmes. You know, so that's another way in which we see. Uh, and, and then the last way, which is the most difficult, is the normative agenda. And so if I go back to Beijing, why did it happen? Well, one of the reasons why it happened is because there was an alignment between the actors and the producers. You know, uh, and if you don't get that alignment of the of the interested parties, then you're not. It's not going to happen again. And why <coughs> will Marrakesh happen? It will happen in part because there's an alignment between uh, the World Blind Union and the publishers that is, you know, been worked on for a number of years, as you know. And I thank you for all of your engagement in that. So I think it's very important that we think about this, but I'm not sure what the answer is. Uh, and uh, one of the things that we're trying to do this year, which is new, uh, is to have uh, a half a day in our assemblies devoted to an enterprise forum, <coughs> uh, which will be more open. Uh, it's only a small start, but it will see uh, a uh, a wider engagement in our assemblies than has been the case uh, previously. Do you want to? I am a uh, uh, Indian Tupac Movement representative. Thank you very much for your invitation to the meeting for exchange the, this uh, idea the, the, the week. And General Director, in my opinion, in opinion of indigenous people, the, uh, today the WIPO, the uh, intellectual property right, the funded plus the interest in economic, political interest in of the Western country, of the rich country. <coughs> of course, I am, I am Bolivian. In our country, our country is rich in resources, genetic resources, traditional knowledge. A Western country, rich country, requested to the developing country to transfer it all the all the rich, the resources to the pharmaceutical agribusiness country enterprise. E, in my opinion, the uh, WIPO is accept only only registered the patent of of the solicitor of the of the country of the rich country. Of course, which is the result? 
The result is the indigenous people have, uh, have not the access to the uh, resource, genetic resource, natural resource. Today, today, of course, today, the committee, not the uh, work of committee, not progress, any progress, any progress during 12 years. Because it is, today it's existed the, through a obstruction, obstruction from Western country to developing country, imposed, imposed their political, economical, political, decision, political. Today, during this, this week, not plenary, only this private meeting. Why it is not for the indigenous people not acceptably? Because we, we hear the poor people. You haven't the resource to come in, in Geneva, where is the too much cost of life. You request the general director uh, in this power to take the measure for the committee advance it, the progress it in this, in this week. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Parry. Well, uh, yes, as you know, the, the, the meeting, you're participating in it, the meeting is going on this week. It's extremely complex. I do think we are making progress. Um, and uh, yes, it has been a long time, but we're making progress. Uh, particularly if you take a question like, let's be realistic, if you take a question like genetic resources, this has, uh, in the Nagoya Protocol, there was no, not uh, a disclosure provision. It was not there. Uh, it hasn't succeeded in WTO. So now, you know, this is not a banal issue. This is a fundamental issue that it's going to take, I think, uh, a bit more discussion. But we're making progress. So uh, thank you very much, Ahmed and Jens, for the continuation of yours. Uh, <coughs> sorry. So I'm Ahmed Abdel Latif uh, from the International Center for Trade and Sustainable Development. Uh, thank you, Mr. Director General, for this uh, overview. It's a, a welcome tradition that you have established uh, in, in WIPO, and I think that is uh, something very welcome, and we pre appreciate very much this opportunity to dialogue with you. Now, on this issue in particular, that, that in your response on the Enterprise Forum, yeah. I wonder if you could elaborate a bit on this. Uh, this is an interesting proposal. Uh, I think. Uh, 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 nobody can deny that the private sector has an important role, contribution to make. Us, we try to involve it even in our activities. But uh, there is a risk maybe that you are elevating one stakeholder at a higher uh, position uh, than others. Yeah. Uh, and I mentioned specifically public interest NGOs. Mm -hmm. So maybe the year after, maybe there's a, sec, uh, a half day for, for, for maybe civil society. Or you have the model of the WTO forum that yep. brings together everyone so, so that is a bit, if you can elaborate a bit. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Look, uh, I mean, I, I think that I can't give you definitive answers on this because it's under discussion uh, or under consultation with member states as we develop the nature of it. But the way I would look at it, at it is that it is one step and a first step only towards you know, increased multi-stakeholder engagement in our principal meeting. So our principal meeting, of course, the assemblies, has always been uh, just state state discussion with, of course, the, the NGO participation that we have had as observers. Uh, now, I think that uh, as a result of the suggestion and proposals of a number of member states, we're moving you know, one step closer towards having uh, more significant uh, multi-stakeholder um, engagement. But at the moment, of course, it's not complete multi-stakeholder engagement, you know. Uh, and uh, so I would be a little bit patient, if I may ask you, while we develop this. Uh, we don't want it to get, you know, rolled over before it actually occurs. Uh, and, uh, but I think that that's, that's the way in which I would consider it. Mm. Please. Thank you, and thank you very much for the invitation. My name is Konstantinos Komaitis, and I am with the Internet Society. Um, 
first of all, it is very refreshing to hear an international organization like the World Intellectual Property Organization talking about multi-stakeholder processes as you must uh, know the Internet Society is a true believer of uh, multi-stakeholder processes and we have worked uh, at, with WIPO during the Internet Governance Forum uh, uh, to, uh, and we have had workshops based on multi-stakeholder processes. I would like to echo uh, what I've heard before. It is very important that there is a clear balance as much as feasible and I know uh, we understand, I think, everybody in here that it is a learning process for each and every organization and it takes time, uh, and to this effect, uh, the Internet Society uh, is here to assist you and offer uh, its experience. Also, there are other organizations like the OECD that have started opening up to multi-stakeholder processes that you might want to consider. And going back to potential solutions, uh, last year, uh, it was the Standing Committee on Trademarks that was discussing the issue of intermediary liability and that member states requested more information. And uh, during that Standing Committee, a, a multi-stakeholder panel was actually organized uh, and we participated and we thank WIPO for the invitation. And uh, my understanding at least uh, was that uh, they felt, the member states felt that this was a very useful information in order for them to reach decisions. So potentially this is one uh, way that you might want to look at, fully realizing of course that all standing committees, their schedules are very busy. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, and well noted. Uh, and as I said, just if we could be a little bit patient with this because uh, we need to <laughs> take first steps and, uh, and develop it. But you do point to uh, another way in which this is occurring, and you're quite right, uh, uh, the intermediary liability um, uh, panel that was held, which was very successful, I think, and which enriched the discussion, actually. And we've also done that in the area of VIPs. Uh, actually, our member states, two of the member states, the United States and Mexico, did that for ambassadors. There was uh, a, an evening in which the, the publishers put forward their uh, uh, concerns about the process and the, VI, the blind associations put forward their concerns about it. And so I think that was very useful. And I think that's going to happen more and more, yeah, I would say. Jens, shall we go? Uh, please, this gentleman, yeah. Thanks. I'm Aziz from MSF, and uh, you just mentioned in one of your responses about WIPO research. What we understand that perhaps the WIPO research is expanding and there are new collaborations and new members of the consortium now. So in MSF, we wonder that if you, at any stage and point, if you would consider uh, putting all existing agreements between different kind of collaborators in a public domain so we can really see that which kind of future access approaches would be there uh, through this very important initiative. And my second question is about, uh, you didn't mention today, but the other day you were mentioning about WIPO Essentials. Uh, we just wonder that why it's taking so long that this uh, project, uh, we have been discussing and talking about this, but it is still not there. Yeah, well on the first, um, look, I think again, we are in relatively early days of, of this. It's going very well, as you said, we've gone last year from 31 to 62 uh, members of the WIPO research. Uh, there are, I can't give you the exact number, I forget the figure, but I think eight collaborations that have been organized or ten collaborations that have been organized, you know, which go from anything from taking a scientist from uh, Ghana to um, uh, uh, West Coast University in the United States to spend time in a research laboratory to, to actual licenses of compounds for research purposes and discovery <coughs> purposes. Uh, we can co certainly consider your suggestion of the extent to which these collaborations can be made more transparent so that you can see exactly what's happening. And we, I think it's a good suggestion, you know, because it can only help the process. Uh, as far as uh, WIPO Essential is concerned, for those who may not be aware of this, this is uh, an idea to develop a, a database which would give you information about the property rights or patent rights that exist in relation to any of the medicines that, uh, that are on the WHO list of essential medicines. As you may know, most of those are off patent, but not all of them. 
uh, and but developing uh, uh, a database which can give you a landscape of the pattern rights that exist would be very helpful. Why is it taking so, ta so much time? Well, it's essentially a question of funding and uh, prioritization. Uh, and uh, we've been working on research and green in that area. Uh, and we are trying to get further engagement from external partners to ramp up the, this because we think it would be a very good service, actually. So we, we have certainly not lost sight of it. We, we think it would be good to develop. Can I go to Dominique uh, uh, from FIA, the International Federation of Actors? And we have to come back to you, Jens. You're Thank you very much for this opportunity to meet with you again. Um, and of course, the last time we met, it was a very exciting moment for us. Uh, we were very galvanized by the successful conclusion of the Beijing Treaty that we've been uh, lobbying for uh, for decades. So it was a glorious moment for our members. Um, but now, of course, we know, both of us know what's our next goal. Uh, and of course, treaties are very important, but they need to be ratified and ratified by a certain number of countries in order to enter into force. And so, you know, this is now what we are, what is facing us. And, and of course, we can mobilize our members. There will be a certain degree of expertise uh, that will offer our members in order for them to understand exactly what's in this treaty for them. Um, and, but there's also the issue of, um, uh, financial means and resources in order to be able to um, encourage countries to ratify this important um, convention as, as quickly as possible. And so uh, the question I wanted to ask you um, was, you know, to what extent uh, WIPO has, a, um, has worked out a, a plan uh, to move us towards a, a quick ratification and entry into force of this treaty what kind of resources um, have been set aside for this, and, and to what extent we as representative of performers organizations, whether it's unions, guilds, collecting societies, can uh, be a part of this process, because we have a lot of expertise uh, that I'm sure you may want to use uh, so as not to reinvent the wheel uh, and be able to use people that actually already have knowledge that they can share with governments in guiding them towards uh, uh, a quick ratification. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, well, two pieces of information, if I may. One way of <coughs> assessing um, the activity in member states uh, in relation to a treaty is the number of uh, times uh, states request certified copies of the treaty. And the reason they request certified copies of the treaty is because that was that's what they put before their parliaments or their governments, the official copy. And so I can tell you that that's happening a lot for the Beijing Treaty. So we are uh, there. There is definitely activity out there in terms of of uh, ratification processes that are going on. Uh, and then the second thing is yes, look, uh, we are um, developing this plan for. Uh, bringing the treaty into force and bringing its uh, its merits to the attention of a wider audience. Uh, and we do have some things planned for this year and we would very much appreciate the, uh, the participation of FIA because I think, as you say, you have the expertise and you can uh, present a very forceful and persuasive case to, uh, to audiences. So we would look forward, we will follow up with you, Dominique, and uh, look forward to you know collaborating on that. Please. My name is Barbara Stratton. I'm representing IFLA. Um, we asked um, for libraries and archives to be put on the agenda because the uh, next S proper SCCR 26 will be devoting two days to libraries and archives um, in July, and. We wondered whether the Secretariat would be working to develop knowledge amongst um, member states about libraries and archives by running regional seminars. Um, we believe this was done uh, in the run-up to discussions about broadcasting. 
and uh, how IFLA and uh, its sister associations could assist with this. Um, I understand that there has been a request from some countries for a regional seminar in uh, the Middle East, but I don't know if there have been any other requests. Could you elaborate on what we might do between now and July? Yeah, sure. Look, um, I, I'm going to give you an answer that may not be entirely satisfactory to you. And uh, I don't want to be insulting, but member states can't do many things at a time, mm. you know. Mm. Um, it's just, it, there's just, if you look at the, the agenda for member states in Geneva and all of the agencies, it's not just WIPO, of course, you know. They have trade, they have uh, human rights, they have telecommunications, they have health policy, they have meteorological policy. Uh, they have so many things that, uh, that are on their agenda that for us to focus their attention on our things, you know, is, is an effort. Uh, we're not necessarily the top of the priority. So until Marrakesh is concluded, that will be our priority. Uh, and, and so you mentioned July, and I know we have an important discussion in the, in the Standing Committee coming up in July, but I think what we have to do is to land these balls one by one, and the first one is the VIPs. And then we will certainly be coming to libraries and archives, and I think that you will agree that good progress has been made in the Standing Committee up until now, and we're very open to uh, collaborating uh, in terms of regional uh, seminars about raising awareness of what the issues are and what the solutions are. Yeah, I, I rather thought you'd say that would be all hands on deck for the yeah. um, VIP yeah. treaty. Um, but in that case, then, would we be looking for doing something basically in the wake of the next SCCR in, in the months following that? Um, you mean in the wake of the February or no, no, the, the, uh, the July? CCR 26, yes, July. I would. Th I think that we ramp up after July. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So until July, I think the focus, at least I, I believe the focus is Marrakesh, right, and okay. and VIPs, and then in the second half of the year we can be more active in the area of libraries and archives. W would you welcome some suggestions from IFLA? Of course. Sort of how we might do this. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, by all means, That's please. Great. Thank mm. you. I have a question about uh, privilege. Uh, privilege for patent attorneys have been on the agenda for a long time. Do you plan to do something about that in, in the coming year? Uh, well, yes. I mean, it's not, it depends on who you are, is, you know, uh, because it's really the member states that are going to decide this. Personally, I believe that that's an issue which has a, you know, a great deal of merit because it's a truly international issue. It's one that requires an international solution as opposed to uh, being one that can be dealt with at, the, at a national level. Uh, and it's a technical, specific thing that, you know, uh, that should be able to proceed. But I think it's a question of, get, uh, of there being enough confidence on the part of the membership that this is not going to do any harm, you know, and uh, first, and secondly, uh, enough, uh, um, it's a question of priorities and time. Uh, but the Standing Committee will be considering this, on Standing Committee on Patents will be considering it, as you well know, uh, and um, I hope that they start to advance th this, this question, you know, that's the best answer I can give you, I'm afraid. Uh, Catherine, I think you want it, yeah? Thank you. I'm Catherine Hagen with the Global Social Observatory today. We're looking very much at nutrition issues. And I was intrigued by your remark about WIPO Green. Could you elaborate a little more on that? And if it's, if it's more focused on the environment and not on agriculture, could you also talk a little bit about what's going on in the field of outreach to the agricultural sector with regard to platforms and so forth? Okay, well, look, uh, WIPO Green has not yet been launched, so I don't want to say too much <coughs> about it, but, but uh, it's essentially a marketplace for green technologies. Okay, so it's to support the, uh, the transfer of green technologies uh, in a, in, as a marketplace. So it's not focused on agriculture. 
Uh, as far as the agriculture field is concerned, um, there are two things perhaps that I could mention. One is there's something called the World Seed Project. And the World Seed Project is a collaboration between uh, our sister organisation, UPOF, you know, the uh, International Convention for the Protection of New Varieties of Plants, FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organisation, uh, the International Seed Federation, and the OECD. Uh, and that uh, collaboration seeks to provide to countries that wish a complete package about how to have an effective seed industry. Uh, because each of us does something different. So at, at UPOF we're concerned with, with new plant varieties. Uh, OECD is concerned with seed certification. You know, uh, FAO is concerned with capacity building uh, and uh, so on. And the International Seed Federation has a lot of, of expertise. The Seed uh, Federation has a lot of expertise amongst seed companies. So I think it's a very good idea. And, um, uh, and we have pilot countries in two Afri uh, pilot projects in two African countries. But we're looking for more funding to advance this vehicle. Uh, and the second one is that we have uh, and I can't remember exactly the status of this, but we have uh, an event planned uh, for uh, assisting in the amelioration of the improvement of, of uh, seeds and plant varieties in Tanzania, uh, which, is, which is underway. Uh, but that's the extent. I mean, there has been some discussions with some interested uh, companies about the possibility of creating some form of platform that might be something similar to WIPO Research or WIPO uh, um, Green, uh, but it hasn't got off the ground yet, and we are resource limited, frankly, yeah. Um, yeah, Carolyn. <coughs> Carolyn Dobbin from the Quake United Nations office in Geneva, and we've been working around intellectual property issues, more from the policy angle for quite some years now, um, and we're very interested in this question of agriculture, um, and therefore our focus has been on, on UPOC primarily. So my question to you, and I don't know if you're able to take it in this meeting, because I'm aware we're invited to you as, to this meeting as with you as director of WIPO, and my question is actually to you as um, director of UPOP. And it would be very much welcome to know the, the initiatives you've taken for a strategic realignment of, of WIPO and initiatives such as these. And we noticed the striking contrast really in, the, in our ability to have this kind of discussion within UPOP. And I was just wondering, um, I mean, particularly because we're all faced with this you know, increasing challenge and need to broader multi-stakeholder involvement. There's a huge amount of expertise amongst all sorts of groups that have great difficulty in accessing um, UPOP. And so I was just wondering if you do have any plans, if you're able to respond on any you know, ideas for um, kind of a similar strategic realignment for UPOP as for Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, look, uh, um, it's, it's, a, it's funny how you know, two organizations can exist in the same building and have completely different cultures, but that happens. And, um, and uh, the UPOF culture has been very different, as you know. Uh, uh, but it is changing in certain respects. I mean, what are the respects in which it's changing? Well, one is that, that uh, its membership is broadening. Uh, there is an increased participation on the part of developing countries. That's something that we have, uh, uh, you know, that is very definitely happening. A second thing is that there has been a liberation of some of the resources of UPOF into the public domain. Uh, so there was a system once in UPOF in which the website had differential access and you couldn't accede to the documents of the, what's called the consultative committee uh, and the council uh, in UPOF. And um, now that has been loosened and those documents have been uh, let in, uh, allowed into the public domain as it is by the membership, by the way, and it's very much a member-driven organisation, UPOF, uh, by, uh, by them. There has been an increased participation of NGOs in UPOF uh, and we have seen some new NGOs join. 
uh, in the last uh, two or so years, as you're aware. Um, so I think that you know change is underway, uh, but uh, it's it's um, an organisation again, without wishing to insult anyone, it's an organisation whose member states, uh, whose representatives come from ministries of agriculture, and from the registration side of ministries of agriculture. So they're not necessarily confronted with you know the 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 full panoply of public debate uh, that. Um, uh, those who are uh, delegates in WIPO are. Uh, but I think that you will see it, um, and we are very open as the Secretariat of UPOF to seeing this expansion and opening of UPOF. I'm Stefan Freischem from AIPPI, the International Association for the Protection of Intellectual Property. And um, my um, well uh, intervention actually refers to, to earlier intervention. It's a, a pity that the second speaker isn't here anymore uh, from Bolivia. Um, I'm very grateful to uh, WIPO uh, for uh, this very open and balanced approach to intellectual property uh, in the uh, different committees. Um, the inclusion, and very intense inclusion of traditional knowledge in the uh, uh, Standing Committee of patent, on Patent Law has uh, moved an association like ours, and I think that's not natural for uh, mainly IP lawyers, IP professionals, um, to uh, apply their uh, two-year um, international uh, comparative law study process to the question of um, uh, importance of traditional knowledge in uh, the world of IP. And I think uh, it's a start for us. Uh, we haven't solved all of the questions, but we have identified some of the questions. And I think it's a, a very good approach and move towards the balanced system. Um, with respect to my, uh, the intervention of my colleague from EPI, um, the uh, confidentiality of IP lawyers advice is uh, for us uh, at AIPPI also a very important topic. And again, it was very helpful for us to see this open, very controversial, uh, but very constructive discussions in the uh, Standing Committee of Patents. One information that prevailed there uh, was that uh, it seems to be for a number of countries a national issue, an issue that um, um, is probably not to be solved by uh, uh, an international association, but rather by the um, countries in the individual, um, the governments in the individual countries. So um, we picked up the message out of these discussions together with a number of sister IP associations like FICP and the US um, Association ARPLA, and we'll be um, um, holding a colloquium on the confidentiality of IP lawyers' advice in June in Paris. Um, it'll be announced on the websites of these associations, and we hope uh, to uh, be able to make use of the, um, uh, the discussions and the findings in the SCP uh, over the past five years. But that brings me to the SCP. Um, with some of the issues um, of interest to the industrialized countries going at a very slow pace. How do you envision the, the future working program of the SCP? Or do you have a plan for a balanced work program there? Look, the member states at 2 a.m. on Saturday morning were unable to envisage the future of the SCP. So, uh, uh, when they last met, so I'm not sure that I can. Um, you know, I think it, it just a couple of comments around it because I can't give you a direct answer. I don't know what the answer is, uh, it, and, it, and it's the member states who will decide this, uh, obviously. But a couple of things. We have the greatest difficulty in, in moving forward in the area of patents. You know, if you look at our agenda, copyright is moving, if you like, or the creative industries are moving. Uh, Trademarks generally, you know, don't present uh, such great difficulty, and 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 um, designs are moving. Uh, so why is that? And one of the obvious reasons is that the extent of participation in the patent system is uh, is relatively 
small uh, on the part of developing countries compared to those other areas. I mean, developing countries, as I said earlier, are very rich in the creative industries in, uh, and in uh, creative content. Um, and they all use trademarks. Any, any market in the world, no matter what size, has a, has a need for signaling. Uh, and they, as I said earlier, also use designs. So patents is our area of uh, where the, the, the greatest difficulty occurs in moving and where the greatest differences, frankly, occur around the world. Um, so I think it's, it's uh, our approach as a secretariat, and we are only, uh, you know, at best facilitators uh, in this process. It's, it's, it's member states who are going to be deciding. Our approach is trying to uh, create uh, an atmosphere of confidence and trust by moving forward in the things that are doable, you know, and uh, VR, uh, AV, audiovisual was doable, VIPs is doable, we think designs are doable and so on. And in that way get a greater level of trust which will enable us to uh, tackle larger questions. And there are lots of larger questions out there that are not on our agenda. Um, so we, are, we have been, if you look at our agenda, it's actually quite an old agenda. You know, IGC has been around for 12 years. Um, audiovisual was around since 1996. Uh, broadcasting has been around since 1996. Designs is not so long. Um, and uh, so the, it's not, you know, you can't accuse us of, of having a new agenda. Um, and if you if you want to look at uh, the issues in the f in after these ones, what are they? And I think that's a question that we need assistance on. You know, uh, we do need a assistance on this. There are lots of questions out there. Orphan works is one possibility. I just throw it out. You know, there is. Uh, uh, I'm not necessarily suggesting it. I think there are there are, there are a lot of questions that you you might consider. Uh, but um, increasingly, I think one of the, the tasks uh, is to decide what should be done internationally. Because not everything has to be done or can be done internationally. Uh, but some things are needed to be done internationally. Now, arguably, you could say that, that the uh, making national uh, exceptions and licensing schemes for visually impaired, impaired talk, talk to each other is an international question. You know that requires can only be solved by an international instrument for for the visually impaired. Um, and arguably, you can say that the confidentiality of legal advice is an international question. Can only be, you know, the problem arises there. And and please correct me, Steph, um, if I'm wrong. Is that you know you have now multi-jurisdictional litigation. As, as a commonplace, it's occurring all the time. Uh, litigation in, uh, uh, over the same subject matter occurring in different jurisdictions. So you, if you have differential uh, legal rights of protection of the privileged information or confidential information possessed by a lawyer, then you can exploit that and get in one jurisdiction information that is useful but not able to be obtained in the other jurisdiction. So this is the essence of the problem. Well, it's an international problem. You can't, you know, you can't solve that by one country's legislation. So I think we have to perhaps get a bit better at identifying what are the international uh, issues that are needed to support the, the uh, globalised use of technologies, which is a fact, and the uh, you know, global uh, economic <coughs> behaviour, which is also a fact. So I didn't really answer your question, but there we are. Eric, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Uh, how the NGOs could contribute to, to making this better work? I know you've been organizing in connection with uh, some uh, standing committees meetings, um, preparatory meetings or mini seminars or things like that with the member states, and um, whether NGOs could be involved in, in such <coughs> workshops or, or seminars uh, in order maybe to develop awareness of such, such or such problems with the member states could, could help the process maybe? 
Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, and another suggestion is that I think that you have to talk to governments. And uh, I don't know whether Dominique is still here. Dominique Luca is still here behind the pillar, yeah. Uh, well, you can ask Dominique, you know, how many governments they, the, the actors spoke to in order to get the audiovisual treaty. And I, you know, it, it was an endless process for years, wasn't it? So I think if, you, if you're not getting governments to understand that this is an issue which has, uh, which has an international dimension that needs to be addressed, that it's not going to happen, you know. And so uh, I think you need to, uh, that, that would be the thing that I would suggest, is that we have to, uh, you, you have to put forward an interest that the international community can say, oh yes, we can see the problem and we can see the solution and, and the solution is not going to cost anything, but it's, it's not going to damage anyone, but it's going to pr produce a benefit. Yeah. Please. Yes, uh, Rick Vera from Lighthouse IP. <coughs> I want to refer back to, um, you talked about the poor cousin of intellectual property, the uh, industrial designs, the Hague, uh, the Hague Treaty. Uh, you discussed the uh, advances in the normative agenda and so on. Uh, my question, actually there are two. The first is, um, is there a vision uh, for the production of a platform uh, akin to what Patent Scope does for patents? Uh, is there a, a vision for the production of an international platform for designs? Uh, and the second aspect of the same question is, uh, what do you envisage the participation of NGOs specifically to ameliorate the poor cousin uh, that you described? Uh, yes, well, thank you very much. Look, um, there is. We uh, have patent scope, which we believe will become this year the largest free public database of technology disclosures in the patent system with 30 million full text documents available in it. That will happen in the course of this year. And there is, as you know, a global brands database that we uh, believe will become similarly the largest public free database of, of brands information. You'll see that happen by October. Uh, and then the plan is to have the same thing in the area of designs. Yes, so it's, it's, the only thing that's constraining us is resources. Uh, we'd do it tomorrow if we had the resources, but you know, on our planning we won't get to it until later you know, this year. So that's that, and what can you do? Well look, um, I, I suggest that again, if you uh, can make known to governments that and to extent this has been done through the questionnaire that we sent out last year, but if you can make known to governments that, that um, differences in national procedure which do not have any you know, radical uh, policy implication for the government, you know, they're, they're just the product of accidental historical development that they require four photographs instead of three or whatever it might be, that these differences actually constitute an impediment for uh, getting designs into the productive sector, which has obviously economic advantages, but also aesthetic advantages for our enjoyment of, of life, uh, then they'll see an interest in saying, uh, if not saying, uh, le let's support this going forward, at least not blocking it. So I think it's very important to make that voice heard. I just wanted to uh, make a brief comment on the fact, uh, the laudable fact that we now have an NGO liaison officer and how we can uh, maybe jointly brainstorm how we can uh, bring this role into the most uh, productive fruition. Um, and I have two thoughts. Uh, one is what I mentioned earlier, that I actually think it would be great if the NGO liaison officer could help us all ensure that the NGOs, whatever color and flavor we might have and whatever perspective we might have, but that that voice um, has its place in the various debates. And I'm thinking in particular of the Marrakesh Diplomatic Conference, and it'd be great if she had a role there to ensure that all sides um, are part of the actual debate. Uh, that's the one side. But I also think uh, this is not a one-sided thing. I think we as NGOs can also help uh, WIPO. It's not just that WIPO can help us. And here I would like to offer uh, something, and I'm sure I'm speaking uh, 
even though I haven't asked anybody, but uh, speaking everybody out of other people's uh, voices as well. Um, Geneva is a place which is often very far away from the, from the place where the rubber hits the road or the grindstone or the coal face or whatever you want to call it, from the realities of life. And I think everybody uh, would benefit uh, if uh, we knew that not only member states, but also the staff here at WIPO understands and perhaps even feels it more motivated when they know actually more about the industries and the users and all the people who are working there. And I would like to offer and as a suggestion that perhaps the NGO liaison officer could also think about how to bring in experts from the various perspectives, from the various sides, to actually explain to member states who are interested, delegates, but also to staff here, um, how uh, intellectual property actually works in practice and how it impacts. So I'm thinking again, we heard about libraries and I would fully echo that. I think that's a, a fantastic debate and there are some seminars going on that IFLA, the libraries, and we, the publishers and the collecting societies are doing together with WIPO as a, as a training and, and education exercise. And we'd love to do the same kind of thing in the areas that are now up for debate, such as education, uh, archiving, etc. Do you want to answer? Look, uh, thank you, Jens. I couldn't, I could only, you know, uh, uh, warmly welcome this. I think it would be great. And um, we have started something within the Secretariat calling it, called an Inspiring Speakers Program. So uh, we'll put you on the list for uh, addressing the staff on this. And. Uh, and I think, you know, I think it's great if we can have that um, uh, assistance from you in helping us to understand the issues that are out there. Yeah, it would be excellent. So we, Anna will take it up. Barbara, and then the lady here. Could I add to that, possibly look into um, arranging in industry placements for staff, which is something that the IP office in the UK has started doing. Great idea, thank you. Yes, please. Hello, I'm uh, Diana Versteeg, representing Marx, uh, the European Association of representing brand owners, uh, so trademarks. Um, thank you for the invitation, and thank you, Anna, for organizing this. Um, it goes without saying that Marx is extremely pleased with the progress that has been made last year uh, with regards to the Madrid system, the, the increase of uh, new countries uh, in South America, and also the future um, possible uh, accession of the Asian countries. Um, I actually didn't want to make, I didn't have any question. I want to fully support uh, the remark made by Jens. In the past, there have been very successful seminars where Mark speakers have participated uh, and collaborated with WIPO on industrial design seminars on um, geographical indications. And there will be another one on geographical indications, I think. Uh, well, somewhere this year, I think in March, uh, March or June. Um, so I fully support your idea, and I think it, it works very well. Um, with regards to the Madrid system, one question that comes up now, um, although we find it a very successful system, and I work for a company who intensively uses it, um, there is still a lot of improvement to be done, and I think about, for example, um, <coughs> excuse me, the statement of grant of protection. Um, it's not so much a question, more a comment, what can we do as an organization to assist WIPO in convincing the importance of having the statement of grant of protection? Uh, yes, well, uh, indeed it's very important. And I think what one of the things that we're doing is the projects that I mentioned earlier about automating uh, industrial property officers, because that gives them a, a, a much easier capacity to be able to provide the statements of ground of protection. Uh, and I, I think from your side, you know, in insisting on its importance, uh, and that, that, you know, without that, you are not really clear about the landscape of legal rights, uh, is a very important thing to, you know, to be keep <clears throat> to keep uh, transmitting as a message to to uh, governments. Um, and let me just say that, yes, I agree with you, there are lots of improvements in the Madrid system and it's going to, that, that are needed and it's going to be a big focus for us over the next two years because we believe that the Madrid system 
has a lot more potential to be realized. Okay, well, um, I think that's it. Sorry. Yep. Okay. Yes, Barbara, go ahead. Yeah. Get this on this time. Um, last year, um, in April, you, you said that um, you were going to sort of roll out things like online registration, stream texting, <laughs> captioning, um, as well as the, the video recording for all the meetings. Uh, and you, you saw the video recording seems to be there, although half the time it doesn't work. But for those of us who can't be there every day, mm. um, the stream texting is incredibly useful. For the start, you don't have to sit and watch it. Yeah. You, you, know, you can capture it afterwards and then deal with it. Um, and uh, obviously, as um, a UN organization, um, which believing in disability rights and so forth, there will be people coming to meetings who um, will be disabled one way or the other, but they won't be there necessarily to represent a disabled voice. Um, so I wonder what's the progress on this? Because like, I was looking at the um, IGC page today and uh, they had online registration, but uh, there was no evidence of any stream texting as I could see. Mm. Um, and um, I looked at the SCCR page for in two weeks' time and there was no online registration. Mm. So, so I wonder where, where have things got to with all that? Yeah, well, okay, well, I'll, uh, I can't give you a, a, you know, an informed answer, but we will follow up and, and look at it. But in principle, yes, we want to move to online registration. In principle, yes, we are providing uh, not just uh, webcasting, but also captioning and stream text. Uh, so that should be there for all meetings. Uh, we are also expanding the la language coverage um, and that has been a rather major financial burden because all of our committees have gone to seven, six languages, six uh, UN languages now, and all of the documents as well. Uh, and uh, there was a bit of a budget blowout on that which may account for the absence of resources for stream texting. but. Uh, but I'll look into it and we'll see what we can do to see if we can get evenness here. Yeah, okay. Uh, yes, please. Uh, good afternoon, Diego Vergani from the DuPont Company. Um, there is a lot of going on, at least at the EU level, on trade secrets and confidential business information. So there is uh, an effort going on right now. Is the WIPO planning or doing something, or if not intend to do something in this regard? Uh, look, uh, as you know, it's covered in principle. It's covered by the Paris Convention. It's also there is an article in the TRIPS agreement on it. But these are reasonably unelaborated provisions. Uh, I think that it's an area that is uh, exceptionally important and whose importance is underestimated and that it would be good to see advanced. However, I think that it's going to be extremely difficult to get uh, a, a buy-in on a process relating to secrecy in an age of transparency. I, I mean, I think that's our essential problem. So if you can, if we can change the terminology and it's not trade secrets, but confidential information, perhaps, or know-how, uh, I think that would help us being able to tackle this issue, which is, which is obviously of fundamental importance, you know, fundamental importance, but it's just not on the agenda. But we have to get over that initial gut reaction to secrecy must be bad. I think. Okay, well, uh, thank you all so much for coming and for your participation. And uh, please don't hesitate to follow up with Anna with suggestions as to how we can improve this, this process. Thanks.